Hello students, we'll be studying about the development of central and the peripheral nervous system in our today's class. So your specific learning objectives are you should be able to describe the development of the neural tube and you should be able to describe its histogenesis and you should be able to describe the development of basal and the alar plates then you should be able to describe the development of neural crest cells and their derivatives with the neurocrystopathies and this is the only uh, repeatedly asked question in all of your exams then the development of central nervous system with its derivatives the development of peripheral nervous system and the related anomalies so firstly we'll start with a brief review of what we have already studied before so i'm drawing a second week embryo this is a bilaminar germ disc and supposedly this one is the primitive streak then this one is the henson's node at its cranial end from where all the epiblast cells they will migrate they will undergo epithelial to mesenchymal transformation and they will migrate inside to form the mesoderm. This one is the connecting stock which I'm drawing. So this one is the cranial end. This one is the cranial end. And this one is the caudal end. Now this one what you are seeing is from the above. We have removed the amniotic cavity and we are just seeing the embryo. And that is in the form of a flattened disc. So this one is the epiblast cells. So now this primitive streak through this Henson's node, the epiblast cells, they will undergo epithelial to mesenchymal transformation and they will form mesoderm and few of the cells will first migrate and they will form the notochord. Now this notochord, it will induce the overlying epiblast cells so that they might transform or they, they will transform into the neuroectoderm. So this surface ectoderm will, under the influence of the underlying notochord, will form a neuroectoderm, right? So now this neuroectoderm will give rise to the neural tube and thereby the brain and the spinal cord. So we'll just take this uh, blue colored neural plate so it will start undergo folding so the folding will commence at the level of fourth somite stage it will start from the fourth somite stage and then it will commence craniocaudally so firstly at the fourth somite stage it will fuse and then the fusion will commence anterior to posteriorly. So this one is the anterior neuropore and this one becomes the posterior neuropore. Initially these neuropores are not closed so that the amniotic cavity is constituently nourishing these neuroepithelial cells which are lying the, lining the neural tube. Now this neural tube it is more expanded in the at its cranial end so the brain vesicles they are formed before the neural folding and the caudal end is narrowed now when there is a, a cephalocaudal folding so what happens this neural tube also it undergoes two flexures on the ventral side so First one is the cervical flexure and this demarcates the spinal cord from the rest of the brain vesicle, right? And the second ventral vesicle is the mesencephalic flexure. Uh, the second bend is the mesencephalic flexure which demarcates the forebrain from the hindbrain. That is the prosencephalon from rhombencephalon and this one is the mesencephalon, right? So this one is about the brain vesicle. Now the spinal cord will develop as such. Now we will see over here, this will be our neural tube, right? 
in the form of a tube now this is lined by the neuroepithelial cells now the neuroepithelial cells they will con continuously divide and they will migrate outside so two more layers are formed so this one which i'm draw drawing is the this thickness this one is the mantle layer okay and furthermore division will lead to formation of a marginal layer okay this will be same for throughout the neural tube only there will be certain changes in differentiation in case of brain and in spinal cord otherwise the basic remain arrangement remains the same right so this one is the marginal layer which will be containing mainly the neural bodies and this uh, sorry the mantle layer and outside is the marginal layer which is myelinated which is made up of nerve fibers so it will be constituting of the tracts right now because more and more cells are being added in this layer so there will be a pair of thickening right so suppose we say that this one is the dorsal side and this one is the ventral side so a thickening on the basal side will be the basal plates and thickening on the dorsal side will form the alar plates right so we have got alar plates on the dorsal side we have got the basal plates on the ventral sides and between these two thickenings there is a longitudinal groove this one is the longitudinal groove throughout the length this is known as sulcus limitans right so now with this brief knowledge we will start with our class so firstly what is neurulation neurulation is the process in by which the neural plate transforms into a neural tube so neurulation if you remember it involves four main events firstly the formation of a neural plate how it was formed under the induction of the notochord the overlying neuro ectoderm the ectoderm it thickens the cells elongates and they will form a neural plate then there is a shaping of the neural plate that is the cranial end is somewhat expanded the caudal end is narrow <coughs> excuse me then it undergoes bending so when it form, uh, bends like a book so a groove is formed so a neural groove is formed during bending and finally the closure of this neural groove so when this neural groove is forming there is formation of the two pores anterior and the posterior neuropores now you can see over here this one is the anterior neuropore this one is the posterior neuropore so anterior neuropore and the posterior neuropore permits the nourishment of these neural epithelial cells from the amniotic fluid until and unless it is supplied by the blood vessels by the forming cardiovascular system <coughs> excuse me so the neural plate it will fold to give rise to neural tube which is open at both the ends the ends being known as anterior neuropore and the posterior neuropore i have told you the the fusion of the neural tube starts at the fourth at the level of the fourth somite and then it commences cranio caudally so cranial neuropore will close first at around day 25 and it will become lamina terminalis right and the failure of anterior neuropore to close results in upper neural tube defects example is encephaly now the posterior neuropore if it Uh, it closes by the day twenty seven, and if it fails to close, it results in no lower neural tube defects. <coughs> Excuse me. Now we'll start with the development of the brain. So our neural tube is formed. Now how it transforms into brain and spinal cord. So this is our neural tube. The this one is the cervical flexure, which marks. the uh, which demarcates the brain vesicle with that of the spinal cord right 
Now the three primary vesicles, brain vesicles, will further will be formed. They are known as prosencephalon, mesencephalon, and rhombencephalon. And further secondary brain vesicles are formed from these, namely telencephalon, diencephalon. Mesencephalon remains as such. Then rhombencephalon divides into mesencephalon and myelencephalon. So over here, this neural tube, because of the craniocaudal folding of the embryo, it will undergo also. It will also undergo folding. So there is formation of two flexures. One is the cervical flexure, which demarcates the spinal cord with that of the brain vesicle. And second one is the mesencephalic flexure, which demarcates the prosencephalon from rest of the rhombencephalon. Right? Then further, this rhombencephalon <coughs> it undergoes bending, and this one is a dorsal bend, which is known as pontine flexure. So this demarcates <coughs> the division of rhombencephalon into a cranial. Uh, Mesencephalon and a caudal part, which is known as myelencephalon. So myelencephalon will form medulla oblongata, and mesencephalon will form pons and cerebellum. Uh, over here, you can see these are these are rhombencephalon and certain small divisions, uh, R1, R2, R3. You can see so these are the rhombomeres which are formed, and on the dorsal side because of this pontine pressure, there is formation of a rhombic lip. So these rhombic lips will give rise to cerebellum, right? So metencephalon it give rise to cerebellum and the pons. Mesencephalon will give rise to midbrain, and this prosencephalon will give, further divide into telencephalon and diencephalon. <clears throat> so diencephalon, by a way of hypothalamic sulcus. Will divide into a ventral hypothalamic part and a dorsal thalamic part, which includes prethalamus or epithalamus, thalamus proper, and pretectum. Right. So there is also a development of an inf infundibular stalk from this diencephalon, as well as optic vesicle from this diencephalon. Optic vesicle will give rise to optic nerve. And the optic vesicle will form rest of the retina and other structures of the eye. So, this is a brief summary. So, neural we had neural tube. So, because of the cervical flexure, because of the head folding, it got divided into a spinal cord, which is the caudal part, and a cranial part, which is the brain vesicle. Now, a further a mesencephalic flexure divi divided. So now we'll proceed further. Now this was the neural tube, and <clears throat> so because of the head folding, the cervical flexure, uh, there was cervical flexure which divided the neural tube into the brain and the spinal cord. Then. There was a mesencephalic flexure which divided this brain vesicle into prosencephalon, mesencephalon, and rhombencephalon. Right? Then, further, this rhombencephalon, because of the presence of pontine flexure, this is a dorsal flexure. These two are the, the cervical and the mesencephalic flexure are the ventral flexures. It divides the pontine flexure, divides rhombencephalon into metencephalon. And myelencephalon. Metencephalon will form pons and cerebellum. Myelencephalon will form the medulla oblongata. Now, this prosencephalon is also known as both brain. It divides into a terminal telencephalon and a diencephalon. The telencephalon will form the cerebral hemispheres and the basal ganglia and also the olfactory bulbs. And the diencephalon, it is divided by a hypothalamic sulcus into a dorsal part and a ventral part. Now, the ventral part will form the hypothalamus, which is the main, uh, it is a group of collection of neurons uh, uh, controlling almost all the activity of the body, and it is said to be the uh, chief control of the endocrinal system of a body. And a dorsal part will form thalamus. <coughs> Uh, which is the relay station of all the sensory, uh, sensory in input of our body. 
then it will form a epithalamus which will lead to the formation of pineal gland it will give uh, an infundibular stalk which will give rise to the posterior pituitary and it will also give rise to an optic vesicle which will give rise to the optic nerve as well as the retinal and the uh, ciliary uh, uh, ciliary muscles of the uh, of the eye so the diencephalon is mainly forming your optic nerve and the retina as well as the posterior pituitary and the pineal gland and the pineal gland so all these structures are neuroectodermal in origin so that is why because the optic nerve is still developing from the optic vesicle which is derived from the diencephalon so that is why it is also known as extension of the brain now we'll start with the development of spinal cord so firstly in the spinal cord we'll read about the histogenesis of the neural tube so we know that the neural tube it is lined by neuroepithelial cells so these are somewhat elongated cells now they will undergo transformation and they will become rounded and they will undergo mitosis and they will differentiate into uh, mainly two types of cells they are known as neuroblast and glioblast so now the neuroblast it will give a variety of cells so of the cells <coughs> excuse me they will transform into the ependymal cells which will stay there uh, lining the neural tube and they will form the ependymal cells and the tiny sites so these will line the central canal in the spinal cord and the ventricles in case of brain right then these neural neuroblast will also further uh, divide and they will form the neurons so they will accumulate in the second layer which is the mantle layer right then second form set of neurons are the, the second set of cells are the glioblast so the glioblast also they will accumulate in this mantle layer and it will also uh, give a variety of cells and then there is a third layer which is known as the marginal layer so all the neurons which are formed over here glioblast will uh, form one of the cells which are known as oligodendrocytes they will uh, result in myelination of these uh, exons so the marginal layer will mainly contain the myelinated nerves so they will contain the ascending and the descending tracts so mainly uh, the neural tube will now get differentiated into three layer a ventricular layer lined by the ependymal cells or uh, and some of the tiny sites then is the mantle layer which is made up of neuroblast and glioblast they are uh, both the cells are differentiating and then is the marginal layer which is mainly made up of myelinated nerve fibers and it is mainly containing the ascending and the descending tracts now this arrangement it remains same throughout the neural tube till the brain stem right except in case of the brain so the histological differentiation of neuroblast is as follows firstly it will be a apolar neuroblast it will be rounded in shape then it will arborize and it will attain two small processes which are no, which will be so it will transform into a bipolar neuroblast and further there is arborization at its cranial end and so it will form into a multipolar neuron now this multipolar neurons they will migrate on the ventral side of this uh, neural tube so they will accumulate into the basal so they will form the basal plates that is the ventral thickening if you remember we have discussed then the glial cells the glioblast they will transform into oligodendrocytes which will result in myelination of the exons uh, of the central nervous system and second set is they will form the astrocytes they will form protoplasmic as well as the fibrillar astrocytes now third set, variety of sets are the microglial cells they are derived they are mesodermal in origin and they are contributed from the uh, cardiovascular system when there is the arterial supply is uh, uh, set or the arteries start supplying the developing neural tube then there will be appearance of these microglial cells so the 
cyto differentiation results in the formation of three layers the neuroepithelial or the ependymal layer which is lining the central canal it is lined by the ependymal cells then is the mantle cell layer which is containing um, mainly the neurons and other uh, other type of cells uh, uh, that is the oligodendrocytes and the uh, ast astrocytes and finally we have the marginal cell layer which is the white uh, this layer takes on an, a white appearance because it is uh, myelinated and it's that is why it is containing the tracts the ascending and the descending tracts so now the formation of the basal alar roof and the floor plates now because of the continuous addition of the neuroblast to the mantle layer what happens there will be a thickening a ventral thickening and a dorsal thickening so there will be a pair of ventral thickening and there will be a pair of dorsal thickening so the ventral thickenings are known as the basal plates they mainly contain the motor horn cells that is the multipolar neurons okay so the ventral or the basal columns they will form efferent columns right because they are supplying they are multipolar neurons right and the dorsal columns or the alar plate they will form afferent columns they that is the dorsal thickening right so uh, from t1 to l3 there is an additional uh, group of neurons also this accumulates between these two thickenings this forms the intermedial lateral horn cell in case of spinal cord which is absent in case of brain stem so that is why thoracolumbar outflow this is mainly the uh, forming the uh, this is mainly having the uh, cell bodies of the sympathetic system right so we have a uh, alar thickenings uh, these are the alar thickenings or the dorsal columns and we have the basal thickenings right and these two thickenings they are separated by a, a longitudinal groove which is known as sulcus limitans now what happens the basal plates and alar plates in brain so it is somewhat uh, the first of uh, first thing which you have to remember is the basal plate in the brain they will regress the alar plates they will accentuate in the brain second thing what happens in brain is there is mass migration of the mantle cell layer into the marginal part so that is why the gray matter the marginal zone is forming uh, the mantle uh, zone is forming the gray matter so that is why in the uh, brain the gray matter there is a cortical gray matter because of the mass migration of the mantle cell uh, layer uh, neurons into the marginal layer so Uh, in the brain there is a distinct basal and alar plates uh, representing the motor and the sensory areas respectively and they are found on each side on the midline in rhombencephalon in the rhombencephalon as well as on the mesencephalon so these basal plates and alar plates they will they are forming efferent and the afferent columns respectively and same will be present in throughout the brain stem so what are these we will see this is the basal thickening this is the basal plate and this one is the alar plate now what is the floor plate this is the condensation of the connective tissue which is joining these uh, the basal plates with the alar plates and the roof plate is the same which is joining the uh, uh, a pair of uh, these alar plates right so over here we are we are seeing the brain stem right so this one is the basal thickening so we have this is the efferent column so we have a somatic efferent column and we have visceral efferent column these two columns will be present in the spinal cord now in the brain stem we have special branchial efferent column as well the column which is supplying the muscles which is derived from the pharyngeal arches so it is also known as branchio motor column right so the cranial nerve supplying the muscles of the uh, pharyngeal arches will be related to this column that is the seventh cranial nerve the glossopharyngeal nerve and the vagus nerve 
right and the mandibular nerve the fifth nerve and this is the general uh, uh, this is the general somatic efferent column which is supplying the muscles the voluntary muscles of the body so in case of the spinal cord it is supplying the uh, uh, voluntary muscles of our limbs in case of head and neck it is supplying the uh, general voluntary uh, muscles of our head and neck right and this is the general visceral efferent column which is supplying the muscles of the glands that is the secreto motor fibers to the salivary glands in the lacrimal gland in case of head and neck as well as in the case of uh, <coughs> excuse me in the case of abdomen or in the case of spinal cord they will supplying the involuntary muscles of the visceras right now this is are the afferent column that is the sensory column so we have visceral afferent column which is taking the sensation from the viscera so general visceral afferent right so in case of uh, head and neck the viscera over here will be pharynx and larynx so general sensations which are coming from the interior of the larynx in the pharynx and the general sensation of the tongue then in brain stem we have a special column that is special visceral afferent column that is taking sensation from our special senses that is the taste sensation and then we have general afferent column which is taking sensation from the skin that is the skin from the auricle from the external auditory meatus in case of brain uh, in case of uh, head and neck and general skin uh, uh, receptor sites in case of spinal cord then in the brain stem we have special somatic afferent column which is taking sensation from the <coughs> otocyst that is the through the eighth cranial nerve so like wise because of these basal and the alar plates we have formation of the functional columns of our in the brain stem now the positional changes of the spinal cord so in the third month of development the spinal cord it extends the entire length of embryo and the spinal nerve they will pass through the intervertebral foramina at their level of origin now with increasing age the vertebral column and the dura it will lengthen more rapidly than the neural tube so the terminal end of the spinal cord it will gradually shift to a higher level so at birth this ends at l3 whereas in adult it ends at the lower border of l2 or l1 right so as a result of this disproportionate growth the spinal nerves they run obliquely from their segment of origin in the spinal cord to the corresponding vertebral column so the dura it remains attached at the coccygeal level the subarachnoid space it ends at the level of s2 and s3 and the spinal cord it ends at the level of l1 in adult <laughs> now the so that was a central nervous system now uh, now the peripheral nervous system so in our body the neurons they originate from three embryonic sources the neuroepithelium lining the neural canal which we have already seen the neural crest cells and the specialized regions of the ectoderm in the head and neck which are known as ectodermal placards so if you remember there was nasal placard and the uh, optic placard which we have already discussed right now the neurons of the cns so they arise from the neuroepithelium as we have seen that the neuroepithelium was transforming into the neuroblast and the glioblast and the ependymal cells and it was uh, then the uh, rest of the variety of the cells of the brain was derived from all these this neuroepithelium is the sole source of the neurons of the central nervous system but whereas in the peripheral nervous system Uh, the so uh, the source of the neurons is through the neural crest cells and these ectodermal placards <clears throat> so over here you can see this one is the olfactory placard and the lens placard now the placards uh, are uh, contributing to the neurons of the uh, the trigeminal ganglia over here you can see the ophthalmic uh, nerve <clears throat> which of thalamic division of the trigeminal nerve then the geniculate ganglia of the 7th uh, cranial nerve the vestibulocochlear ganglia or the spiral ganglia of the 8th nerve then the 
inferior petrosal ganglia of the ninth cranial nerve, the inferior nodose ganglia of the tenth cranial nerve. So all these ganglia they are contributed by the placodes, and these blue one are the uh, ganglia which are contributed by the neural crest cells. So we have learned that the uh, neurons of the peripheral nervous system they are derived from the ectodermal placodes or the neural crest cells. Now ectodermal placodes they are thickening of the epithelial cells or the surface ectoderm under the influence of the uh, developing neural tube. <clears throat> so firstly we will discuss the neural crest cells. Now as the neural tube was folding there were certain cells which are sit uh, situated at its dorsal lip. So before the neural tube closes these cells which are situated on their dorsal lip they will start migrating. So these are known as neural crest cells. And the neural crest cells they are divided into a dorsal mass and a ventral mass. Now the derivatives of these are as follows. <clears throat> so firstly the dorsal mass they are divided into mainly three varieties neuroblast, spongioblasts and pluripotent cells. So neuroblasts they will form the pseudo unipolar neurons of the dorsal root ganglia and the neurons of the sensory ganglia of 5th, 7th, 8th, 9th and the 10th cranial nerves. Now the spongioblasts they will form the capsule or the satellite cells of the, or, the, or the supporting cells of the sensory ganglia and the Schwann cells which will result in myelination of the exons of the peripheral nerves. Whereas in the oligodendrocytes were resulting in the myelination of the central nervous system exons, right? Then there are certain pluripotent cells which is giving rise to melanoblast, to the cartilage cells of the binkel arches, to the leptomeninges that is pia matter and arachnoid, and the mesenchyme of dental papilla and the odontoblast and the dentine. Then the ventral mass, it differentiates into sympathetoblast or small cells which will form the neurons of the sympathetic ganglia and the parasympathetic ganglia of the cranial nerves that is the otic ganglia, ciliary ganglia, submandibular ganglia and the pterygopalatine ganglia. Then the chromaffin cells, the large cells, they will contribute to the suprarenal medulla, the periotic bodies, the urgentafin cells and the enterochromaffin cells and the apid cells. Then these are also giving rise to the dermis, smooth muscles in the fat of the face, the muscles of the ciliary body, the sclera and the choroids of the eye. So you have to remember this in the development of eye, then substantia propria and the posterior epithelium of cornea and the parafollicular cells of the thyroid, the parathyroid and the salivary glands and the bones of the face and the vault of the skull. So all these are the derivatives of the neural crest cells, that is the choroid and the sclera of the eye, except this lens in the lens, because that is developing from the lens placode and the retina and the optic nerve developing from the optic recycle. Then the dermal bones of the head and the neck, the conotruncal septum, then the nerves, uh, the, so the bones derived from the first and the second pharyngeal arches and the third pharyngeal arches. Then the odontoblast, then over here you can see the cranial nerve ganglia, over here you can see the adrenal medulla and the pre-vertebral ganglia and so on. So you have to remember this by heart because you get a short note frequently on the neural crest cells. Now there are certain neurocrystopathies, so they are mainly divided into two types, the defects of migration and the uh, tumors of the neural crest tissues. So the, in the defects of migration mainly the trunk neural crest cells, if they fail to migrate, they will result in aganglionic megacolon. That is, enteric nervous system is absent in the megacolon. So that is known as Hitchfrin's disease. Rest you can go through. And the, the trunk and the cranial neural crest, if they are combined, they uh, fail to migrate, they result in certain constellation of features. That is, they result in certain syndromes, Chard syndrome and the Wardenberg syndrome. So the Chard syndrome, as the name suggests, is result in coloboma of iris since neural crest is uh, contributing to the iris. Then heart disease, iris, it is contributing to the conotruncal septum. Then atresia of the nasal coini. Then the retardation of the uh, development because it is also contributing to the certain um, uh, ganglia of the head and neck. Then genital hypoplasia in males because it is contributing to the adrenal uh, medulla. 
then ear anomalies is also there because it is forming the spiral ganglia of the uh, eight uh, eight nerve <clears throat> then the wardenberg syndrome that is uh, it is mainly because of the defective pigmentation because melanoblasts are affected so there is white stripe of hair and there is deafness there is cleft palate and there is ocular hypertelorism that is wide set eyes now the tumors are many you can remember a few that is pheochromocytomas neuroblastomas neurofibromatosis right rest you can leave now the neural over here you can see these are the neural crest cells which is forming the dorsal root ganglia and the sympathetic chain so how it is being formed so firstly a neural crest cells it will form a round neuroblast right then this neuroblast will similarly as was in the central nervous system it will arborize and it will attain it will become a bipolar neuroblast right then these two processes they will start coming towards each other both of them right so now it will appear as a t shaped mass so both of these they will fuse and they will form a single process so one of this process which is proximal to this uh, spinal cord it will gain its attachment or uh, will synapse with the neurons over here on the uh, dorsal horn and this process will elongate and it will go to the receptor site of the voluntary as well as the involuntary muscle so likewise this the dorsal root ganglia is formed and uh, the sympathetic blast uh, over uh, sorry the spongy blast over here they will uh, form the satellite cells around it or in the capsular cells around it and they will uh, and the schwann cells which are also derived from the neural crest uh, crest cells it will cause the myelination of the around the exons right so likewise this and the neural crest cells also they will condense over here and they will form the sympathetic chain so likewise our Uh, like this, our sympathetic chain and the dorsal root ganglia, it is being formed. Now, so the peripheral nervous system, it is contributed by the neural crest cells, then the neural tube, which give rise to the preganglionic autonomic nerves, right? So both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic, and all the nerves that innervate the skeletal muscles, that because the motor components, so their axons. comes into the peripheral nervous system then the mesoderm which is giving rise to the dura mater and to the connective tissue investment of the peripheral nerves that is the connective tissue which is forming endoneurium perineurium and the epineurium and then the ectodermal placodes the thickening of the ectoderm the cells that will migrate into underlying mesoderm and then they will develop into sensory receptive organs of the cranial nerve first and eighth and the lens of the eye so there are three placodes in a body the nasal placode which will be developing differentiating into the neurosensory cells and they will be giving rise to the olfactory cranial nerve first then is the uh, aortic placode which is giving rise to the otic vesicle which is forming the inner ear the middle ear is uh, uh, formed by the tubo tympanic vesicles and the external ear by the first pharyngeal cleft the external auditory meatus right so that that is the inner ear and the lens placode give rise to the uh, lens which is induced by the optic vesicle and the optic vesicle is formed by the diencephalon so now we come to the neural tube defects that is the non approximation of the neural folds if the neural folds they will fail to fuse they will result in opening in the spinal cord or brain or both so there are two type of neural tube defects open and closed open when their spinal cord or brain if it is exposed to the surface at the time of birth through a defect of skull or a vertebra example is anencephaly or a spina bifida that is the anterior neuropore defect or the posterior neuropore defect right then the closed neural tube defects are rare and they occur when the spinal defect it is covered by skin so it is due to malformation of fat or a bone or a membrane so it also under uh, comes under neurocrystobithies so first one is the encephalo c that is because of the non fusion of the neural tube or the overlying 
bones. So neural tissue is lying outside the cranial cavity or the vertebral canal. Now the failure of the closure of the neuropores. So if the anterior neuropore it fails to close, it will result in anencephaly. And if the posterior neural pore it fails to close, then it will result into the spina bifida. So in the anencephaly, because of the failure of closure of the anterior neuropore, the brain is is exposed uh, to the external environment as an irregular degenerated mass. So generally, the child it only survives for the few hours after the birth. And it, it also fails to gain the consciousness. So in this case, the vault of the skull bones, they are also absent. So that is why the brain is exposed to the surface. Then is spina bifida occulta, which is the defect of the vertebral arches that is covered by the skin and it does not involve any neural tissue. So and generally the vertebral arch they will fail to meet so the generally there is no herniation and the uh, defect is uh, covered by the skin which is uh, having the tuft of hair so this is spina bifida occulta then spina bifida with the meningocele that is the vertebral arch fail to meet in the center but there is herniation of the meninges which is filled with the fluid so that is a cyst like sac so it is mostly in the lumbosacral region. So it is known as spina bifida with a meningocele. Then third one is the spina bifida with a meningomyelocele. So if there is a neural tissue included, it is also being herniated out. Then it is spina bifida with the meningomyelocele. Then is rachisis, that is the neural folds, they have not elevated and they remain flattened. So, the mass of neural tissue is exposed to outside. So, spina bifida with myelocysis or rachisis. So, and the last one is the hydrocephaly. It uh, generally develops in every case of spina bifida cystica. Uh, because the spinal cord, it is tethered to the vertebral column. So, as the vertebral column, it lengthens. It, the tethering will pull the cerebellum through the foramen magnum. So it will cut off the flow of cerebrospinal fluid. So there were ventricles which were also being formed in the brain. So the uh, fluid was uh, drained by the uh, uh, choroid plexus. It was formed from the choroid plexus and uh, it was being drained through the ventricles. So there were lat lateral ventricles with the cavity of the prosen cephalon or the tilen cephalon. Then the cerebral aqueduct was the cavity or the third ventricle of the diencephalon. And the fourth ventricle was the cavity of the rhombin cephalon. And finally, it was continuing with the central canal. So when the cerebellum uh, is pulled through the foramen magnum, it will cut off this uh, flow of the cerebrospinal fluid. And then there will be increased in the uh, uh, pressure of the uh, head. So it will result in the increased diameter of the head and result in hydrocephaly. So that's all. This completes with our lecture.